Welcome everyone to another episode of Price Targets with your host Bitcoin Jack. Welcome back. It's been a while. Market's been super slow. Um, we're going to be talking about Bitcoin price action, ETH price action. We're going to be looking at a few macro perspectives of you know global markets, US equities, China. Um, we're going to be looking a little bit at bonds, but um, we're going to be taking that with a little bit of with a grain of salt. Um, as my experience with bonds is, you know, I'm, I'm learning um, and I'll convey what I see. Then there's a few things that I've been talking about on, on Twitter. I'll be covering those things as well. So probably same kind of setup as the usual price targets videos, um, but we're going to be making a little bit of a longer episode, putting at the tail end um, some of these macro perspectives that um, I do believe that pose some intermediate risk on um, on all kinds of markets, uh, not just Bitcoin. First of all, your attention for the sponsor, Prime XBT, the exchange that is sponsoring this content. Thank you very much for sponsoring Prime. If you sign up with Prime using the link in the description below slash in a watermark and use the promo code Bitcoin Jack, you will get a 50% deposit bonus on your first deposit up to 0.5 BTC. That's kind of a little bit um, of a gift they have for you, but some conditions apply. So make sure you are aware of those. Thank you, Prime. Um, let's dive into a little bit of a recap on Bitcoin. Um, I believe that Pretty much my latest comment on Bitcoin, whether, you know, where I become bullish has been this little squiggly here. Um, and the squiggly and the comments that I made on it was that for me to become bullish, I wanted to see Bitcoin rise at least into um, this level of resistance up here um, or even higher. And if that was the case, I would become interested in finding evidence to go long on a retrace into the green levels here. We kind of, you know, didn't really reach into the level here. We have our mid range level here at like 35.7, 36 ish, which has acted as a resistance so far. And that would have, you know, that would have needed to be claimed into resistance before I'd become um, remotely bullish. For now, price ever since has just been selling off, bleeding. It's not necessarily, you know, I do think this is bearish. Um, if this would have been a spring, you know, I would have wanted to see action up here. I'm not saying that this won't happen, but this just doesn't invite me to um, to go along here, even though, you know, it's at support. So technically the risk to reward into the range high is, um, is you know, kind of nice here this just doesn't give me the confidence that this was a spring and volume has been dropping off too so not really super bullish on that um and um everything that we talked about in the last couple of episodes which has been a while now um still stands you know like if this is going to start to break down there's essentially um two immediate levels to the downside that are of interest for support obviously what could happen is that you know we come down here and then reclaim the whole thing um as a real spring and then just drive into the range high um with a lot of speed but this just doesn't look um bullish for now so until then you know i'm just going to be patient do the same thing i've been doing the last couple of weeks not buying um and waiting for opportunity things to change and um i mean we can talk about eth quickly um we talked about you know the last trade i tried on eth kind of shit the bet um which was along around this level and then we talked about if that didn't bounce that we were gonna take out the lows here and then drive into um the levels above i think if i recall correctly um i outlined orange as the you know the maximum we could go from here and then come down back again i do think that this just doesn't look bullish still same story i do think it's going to come down here and essentially what that means is that you know it's kind of a descending triangle and um the levels down here 
make a lot of sense for the first test at 0.046 um, BTC per ETH. Um, and that's kind of, you know, the high here that we then um, broke into the rally recently. So that's kind of, you know, if we zoom out, that's um, maybe even go lower, but that's kind of where I expect this is going to go, especially after the rejection that confirmed up here. Um, and the fight over this trend line here, um, which is not really, which I find strange, but it's not really working the way it's supposed to. It's kind of, you know, dicking through it, below it, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, just doesn't make me believe that this is going to act as um, as a spring to further upside. So some sell off on ETH BDC makes a lot of sense. Um, we can look at ETH USD right here. Um, I posted this on Twitter a couple of days ago. Um, same kind of story. This kind of feels, remembers, you know, it reminds me of BTC in 2017. Big crash. Let's measure and big. This crash is at 60%. So I think that's very similar to the initial sell off in 2017. And now it's kind of, you know, doing the bouncy ball thing on support here. And the other thing to note on this chart, which I always do like, um, I've set it to um, scales to a locked price ratio, which allows me to draw these trend lines and angles. And as you can see, these are geometric multiples of each other. So 13, 13, 13 degrees and um, this kind of lines up nicely here this kind of nicely adds up here and if we add 13 to this one that's exactly the top we have up there and as you can see it was support here then it kind of broke through it became resistance up here and now it became resistance again within the descending triangle so kind of do feel as if this you know, if you recall what in, happened in 2018 on Bitcoin after the top in 2017, we had bouncing ball kind of behavior, then a sell off, some reaccumulation, and then upside. Um, is this going to get this low? I don't know. Um, technically, that would kind of represent similar sell off as we saw on Bitcoin back then. So we'll keep an eye on that. But again, here, I'm not bullish at all on ETH USD. I'm not bullish on ETH BDC and I'm not bullish on BTC USD. So essentially um, these couple of charts kind of give me the vibe that everything's in for a little bit of more pain. Um, and then you know if you if you have trouble making up your mind on, on, on BTC. A couple of months ago, everyone would be shouting, this is super bullish, this chart. This is the inverted Bitcoin chart. Do with that as you wish. Um, I could be utterly wrong. So, you know, you can always concentrate me. Um, and this is always a possibility. I can always be wrong. But essentially what we have here, you know, sure. Like maybe it's my bias saying things here, but you could say that this is a wedge instead of an ascending triangle. So, you know, we're going to have to watch what's going to happen here. But, you know, this doesn't necessarily look, this looks more bullish than bearish. So if you flip it upside down again, um, you kind of have your answer. To me, I'm, I'm not shorting this. This has, you know, you have one top, two top, three top, four, five, um, you could arguably say that you can, you know, say this is one and these are, you know, one, two, so one, two, three, and this becomes four. Um, it's always arbitrary, of course, to a certain level. Um, so that's kind of the, the price action side of things. And then we can look at, you know, I, I've posted this in June, um, on the, on the ID that, you know, I do think that Bitcoin is missing a fifth wave. So that is still, you know, um, what I think. And I do believe I have that chart somewhere up here. 
yeah, here we go. Um, that just doesn't mean that if, you know, this cannot go lower, um, doesn't mean that this cannot go higher and then go lower. There's always a bunch of possibilities in this case, but um, technically speaking, a fourth wave, you know, needs to respect the high of wave one. So if this goes any lower than the high we printed in June 2019, um, that's worrisome. But in the meantime, you know, the reality is that you have a support here. Um, there's some intermediate consolidations, very small, tiny ones after the breakout of 20K, obviously. And then you have the high up here. Um, Essentially, as long as you stay above here, um, a fourth wave is still valid. Um, and then, you know, ideally you don't get as low as, as this. Um, so whether this is just going to do this and then go up or do this and then come down, I personally believe that if we go down, that's probably the fastest way to, to go back into bullish mode because if... A lot of people have been buying the dip here um, and have been buying the top and have not capitulated yet. The fastest way to get all that supply back into strong hands is to go lower and have people panic capitulate. And how, you know, it, obviously it's, it's, it's possible for price to go up and then you just got to hope in that scenario that those quote unquote weekends or the people who came into the market in you know in in early 2021 early this year are willing to return a supply that was sold by whales and and big hands up here um for a good price um but so far evidence suggests that these weekends or short-term holders who actually have been very strong hands so far have not capitulated that position yet. So the question is whether if price goes up, they will start to um, sell their bags back to whoever sold it here. So game three, theory-wise, um, to you know to get parabolas, you need people to capitulate or sell their positions in such a way that the supply moves back to those controlling the market um, because if that's the case that's how price actually goes up and they make a profit um, so we can look at you know um, the tweet here it's probably you know worth looking at this tweet so first of all um, I see some macro risks in the market, and I kind of collected them here. Um, first of all, China has started kind of quote unquote tapering. Um, they've been funding um, less and less credit. Um, and we can see in this chart here that the market is, you know, the Chinese market is deviating from the US market. The US market keeps, going, keeps on growing and the Chinese market keeps on going down, which is this chart up here. And you can see that, you know, um, in the last couple of years, we've seen this happen a few times before. Um, US equities going up, Chinese equities going down, and eventually that kind of had a crash here. Same thing kind of happened here. Um, you know, so past performance doesn't guarantee future results, but it's just something that caught my eye and I think is worth, you know, not forgetting about. And then the next tweet is on the difference, as you can see here, between junk credit and quality credit. Um, essentially, if the delta between junk credit and quality credit is low, that means that whoever is borrowing whoever is lending money is taking on additional risk because um, they are you know asking the same rates or more similar rates as they would charge people who have a better credit rating um, 
essentially that's where a lot of risk in the market in the credit markets come from is when you start grading junk credit and quality credit at the same level whereas you know junk credit is more likely to start to default which then if they start to default is triggering a whole cascade of liquidity problems in the market and um that's where you know people are going to start to have to start to short um equities for example if you're if you're looking at corporate bonds they will have to start shorting um to hatch their risk on um those loans right um the other thing worth looking at is the BTC supply mechanics at this point. Um, there's a lot of people who've been screaming that the on-chain looks very bullish. I don't necessarily believe that. I think there's a few counter arguments to be made. Um, first of all, we can look at, you know, this is a, a distribution of cumulative um, transaction volume on the BTC chain. This includes change of transactions, which means that, you know, this doesn't necessarily represent actual value transferred. It could be that I have 10 BTC in an address and I pay one BTC to someone and then I keep, um, then I have a nine BTC um, of change in that transaction, which is counted towards this distribution. Um, but in general, we can see that on May 12th, um, close to close to 25 percent so 23 something percent here of the utxo volume occurred above 47k and of if we look at the july 13 levels we can see it's about 15 percent so that's around eight percent which is around a quarter um no a third it's the equivalent of a third of the, um, the volume that was traded above 47k so I'm not I don't necessarily think that's enough um, volume being traded and enough capitulation actually if we do think that you know the short-term holders that are at a loss are uh, selling their position so I don't know if that makes sense if I'm explaining this right but you you know you're more than welcome to dive into these tweets and ask um, you know, to for me to explain a few things. Maybe I will, maybe I won't. Depends on, on how much time I have. Um, and then we can go back like further into this thread, but I probably, you know, invite you to um, just go in there and, and read it. Um, we can look at the affordability of houses, which is above levels of um, unaffordable, blah, blah unaffordability of homes is above the 2008 level so you know that's kind of scary um that means that you know more people than in 2008 cannot pay for a house and we also see that you know some hedge funds are decreasing their their long positions in the s p 500 futures and at the same time you know we still have a backdrop of COVID. um hopefully the vaccines will kind of be enough um, versus the mutations but it's I don't know I don't know whether that's a fixed situation yet and then we have the whole discussion on inflation versus deflation there's some interesting threads talking about the topic where you know deflation can exist alongside inflation um, if too many people simultaneously because there is inflation all all of a sudden think it's good to you know buy certain assets because that's going to protect them from inflation and if suddenly everyone thinks that is the best thing to do you kind of have these huge rallies that we've seen in the S&P 500 for example or in equities because everyone's just you know putting their spare cash um, into into these assets but if at some point somewhere along you know the, the credit risk line um, things start to hiccup and people are, are starting to be default on their payments etc etc they will have to de-risk and if everyone is kind of converged in the same like risk direction um, deflation can actually happen simultaneously where people just have to force sell their positions into a cascade that then triggers more and more and more and more so that is um, an ex existing threat um, but it's really difficult to kind of predict when 
that becomes um, an issue. And um, we will probably see some going back and forth in a you know, couple of next months, maybe the, the rest of the year, whether governments are going to, you know, taper, not taper, and they'll probably not know exactly what they want to do with that because they're kind of in a, in, in, in a, in a shitty position anyways. So, you know, they will have to keep printing to refinance their debt. If they don't do that, then nation states will go insolvent, which they won't because they have the tools at hand to manage their risk. Um, so it's going to be, you know, that's an incredibly difficult environment to navigate, but there's just a few things in this story here that suggests that there is um some tail risk that is increasing like if we if we consider this chart up here you can see that you know the current delta between junk credit and um quality credit is at levels very similar to um well prior to the great financial crisis in 2008 and if you line up these bottoms here this bottom here and this bottom here this bottom here and this bottom here, they're all kind of, they've been precursors to, um, you know, violent moves down in, 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 in the um, global markets. Um, so it is a tricky environment in my opinion and reason in my opinion to consider um, when, you know, looking at Bitcoin, for example, to not just greedily go along here thinking well this is my last chance to to go up in my opinion it's better just to wait and see um if there's any evidence sub like emerging that this price action is meant um, for upside and personally i do think that um a move down is more bullish than a move up because if a move up happens you know it's just going to trap it's most likely going to be a trap and then it's just going to come down again. But if we go down, I do think that we probably have a rally into the same level. So the risk to reward becomes a lot better. Um, and, you know, becoming part of a trap is never really nice. So that's kind of a few um, things that I wanted to talk about. I do think there's a long, one last thing worth looking in. Um, Yes, so GBTC, Grayscale, the Grayscale fund, they're going to be unlocking more um, shares this month. Um, and I believe some in August too. There's a pretty big discussion on what's that kind of bring for Bitcoin's price action. Um, it's, well, let's, let's look at the blue line here first. That's Bitcoin's price. Um, half a year ago. So essentially half a year ago when the people who could participate in these private offers um, of GBTC shares, they were buying Bitcoin at the blue level line. So currently Bitcoin is actually priced lower slightly. And then we have the green line, which represents um, how much dollars it would cost you currently to acquire the amount of GBTC shares that is equivalent to an entire Bitcoin. So each share represents a certain amount of Bitcoins and um, you would pay 27,800-ish dollars to acquire enough GBTC shares that represent one Bitcoin. So essentially, you know, if you unlock GBTC shares right now, um, and you would be, you know, you, you, you would be thinking about selling them. That means that, you know, you're selling it at the discount. Um, and some of the BTC that you, that was bought and put into these, um, into the shares, into the offer was maybe even bought at higher prices. So selling GBTC shares at the unlock at, as it stands with the current prices is selling at a loss or close to a loss. It makes a lot more sense to um, sell BTC and then buy GBTC. Um, you essentially, you could um, short BTC and buy GBTC equivalent and keep that trade until 
the premium or the discount converges to a single point, which at that point is a risk-free trade. If you can, if you know, if you evaluate your um, your trade in just BTC, obviously, if um, BTC drops to zero, it's still going to be a super shitty trade. But if you long-term believe that Bitcoin is valuable and you're looking for a high um, liquidity trade, you know, like there's 650,000 Bitcoins in the fund. So if you can acquire 10 or 20 or 30% of the GBTC shares um, and at the same time are selling the equivalent of BTC um, or shorting BTC in the equivalent amount, there's like 13% discount on GBTC. So essentially you would be netting Assuming that the discount eventually is gonna, you know, converge to to BTC's price, that's um, a pretty sizey trade um, to be to be made, right? Um, so I don't think that um, the unlock is necessarily a bullish or a bearish thing. I just don't think that they will start selling a lot of GBTC shares at the unlock because that's just selling at a discount. Um, we're gonna to have to see how that resolves. Obviously, I won't be able to predict the future. But what I do know is that it makes a lot of sense that once this premium, um, well, discount, in fact, negative premium, starts to to fade, that's probably evidence of people taking that arbitrage trade I was talking about. When you, you know, you buy GBTC and sell BTC and wait until the two converge and that's your profit. Um, once we start seeing evidence of that happening, I think that's um, that's a long-term bullish signal for for Bitcoin, essentially, because right now, you know, I don't believe that those people um, don't care about used devaluations. So the minute they start, you know, buying GBTC and selling BTC and, the pre you know, the, the negative premium disappears, um, that's probably a sign where big money starts to become interested in actually owning um, GBTC at that discount, thinking that we will see a bullish um, period, bullish rally into the future. And that's where, you know, they make most money. Um, so that's just something to keep an eye on. Um, let's see if I have any more cool things. Well, this just doesn't tell me that much, but this is one of my indicators that I use. And essentially what it means that if price manages to stay above the orange line here, um, it kind of gives um, reason to believe that there's a bullish trend supported by orange. And then once it started to, you know, for a long time started to move below it, that's, um, that's a bearish trend. And as you can see, we're still below it. So I'm kind of waiting for this to, to kind of, you know, change. And then we have our little clouds here that act as support and resistance. And then the other thing, while I'm still kind of bearish, but this is more of a macro thing, this is not a reason for me to like instantly buy or sell. Um, but the red areas here indicate bearish on chain price action. And the green areas represent bullish on chain price action. And you know, for now, oops, I'm burping, sorry. Um, for now, this is just not, you know, it's it's also not giving me any reason to, to go degeneratively long. So patience, I guess. And um, I think if you, if you watch the previous videos, you'll, you'll discover some of my thoughts on, um, some of my thoughts on, on downside targets. And um, I think that's it. I hope that made a lot of sense. It's 30 minutes, um, three times as long as the usual video. Hope you enjoyed that. If you enjoyed this and you like to trade on Prime XPT, consider creating a new account using my ref link um, to support this video and um, hopefully catch you next video. Peace.